So thank you. And so uh, Axel Voss has made my work in general, so it's quite easy for me just to introduce uh, the panel today. Uh, basically, I will be here uh, together with one of the other members of our internal task force, which is here with me, uh, Leandro Guerra from uh, Experian. And we are basically interested in artificial intelligence, and in particular, we are working so close uh, on artificial intelligence among these uh, members of task force and so on, because of course, one of the main topics here is the proposal on artificial intelligence. That is to say, the proposal issued by European Commission in April last year, uh, which is particularly relevant for us because not only because we are in the Annex 3, of course, but also because we are uh, exploring as industry the benefits of artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is not new, as the uses of artificial intelligence are not so new, and we are using particularly based on uh, our internal check for enhance the access to credit. Basically for um, a new to credit score, for the inclusion of uh, migrants, young people and so on, where we have no such information. As we have seen, the access to data and information, as we have seen in the previous panel, is one of the first objective, of course, to be uh, performative in our scores and so on. So I will uh, leave the floor now to Leandro Guerra, my colleague, is uh, head of data science uh, for EMEA in Experian, and he will explain us which is the uses of artificial intelligence right now in our industry and which are the focus in terms of, of course, the more ethical aspects related to fairness or, for example, explainability, which is one of my obsession, as you know. <laughs> Thank you, Leandro, please. Thank you very much, Elvira, uh, for the introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, my name is Leandro Guerra, currently head of data science and analytical platforms for Experian in EMEA. And um, it's quite interesting because whenever we hear that word or that couple of words, artificial intelligence, our imagination pretty much blows up. We can think from Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Skynet up to systems that we use nowadays. Now, from my perspective, um, there are many things that they should and they are being actually clarified on exactly uh, what does it mean and what are the benefits that we can take out of it. So if you go to the next page, please. Um, I'm going to be touching some uh, key points on our conversation today. And uh, the emphasis that I would like to give, it's around the benefits that we can have out of that technique. And uh, there are some myths, I would say, that for example, AI, it's a black box, we don't understand what it's in there. Well, they are not necessarily true. If you would go next, please. Uh, one of the main points, it's about, um, for quite a long time, uh, if you would go to the next page, uh, please, um, the deployment and the lack of explainability uh, of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning models were the main barriers uh, in the industry overall. So here, I'm not specifically uh, talking about just one segment. So uh, we have this, uh, uh, this research that was conducted together with the Forest Consulting Group, where they have stated I mean, uh, there was uh, the, an interview with about 600 decision makers around the world, and they have placed it pretty much that uh, the lack of explainability of a machine learning model and the challenges of deploying them were the main barriers that were preventing a larger adoption, which it's fair enough because you always need to consider the trade-off when you, you are implementing a new technology. But the, the biggest point is, and the, here it's, the, it's one of the first aspects that I would like to touch. So if you go to the next page, please. Uh, the machine learning technique overall, it's not a black box. So there are, as naturally it happens in every industry, innovation every year. So in the beginning, that was true. Eventually, yes, it could be considered like that, but uh, since that this was a problem, we had the best minds in the world thinking about how to solve that problem. And uh, actually, nowadays, there are several techniques that can 
explain why a particular machine learning model took a decision in a very transparent way. And the other aspect, it was related to, well, maybe an AI system, it's hard to manage. Well, not necessarily, because it's all about proportionality. So it depends what you are doing with that and to what specific application you are handling uh, the utilization of that system. So when we think about uh, the credit risk industry very much, what we can see is that whenever you are developing something that even could be uh, thought as a, as a machine learning or an AI system, all these steps that we have to follow in order to develop the model, it's exactly the same as the one from the traditional or the so-called traditional techniques. So we need to take care about the data that it's uh, coming in. We need to prepare the data very carefully. We need to understand the attributes. We need to develop then the model. We need to test it. We need to validate. We need to document. And then we need to deploy. And then we need to maintain and provide the support. So exactly all the steps, they are pretty much the same. And uh, what it's really important is that, well, Maybe uh, we, we are used also to think the machine learning models, they are used to that particular final output. So I would provide a score or a kind of a decision. And that it's, uh, uh, it's kind of an incomplete, I would say. If we move to the next page, please. You can use the machine learning models as well to improve the data that you are bringing into your model. So we, we have seen uh, uh, our, our colleague from Shufa in the beginning saying that, well, if I have uh, better data or more data, I could have better outcomes. And the benefits were there. So they were about reducing, I mean, the, the, the number of uh, bad customers improving the scores of several people that eventually they would not necessarily be included. Uh, so there are several benefits. And uh, when you use uh, the, the machine learning model techniques, uh, in the intermediate steps that I was mentioning, you can have uh, huge benefits in efficiency. You can have better data. And there is this cliche in the, in the data science field that it says that, well, garbage in, garbage out. Or your model is as good as your data. So improving the data, improving your attributes are, in fact, a key factor to, to improve the quality of the models overall. And then, of course, there is the, the improvement in the performance that we could have. So here we have a couple of examples uh, where we, we, we had an uh, acceptance model where by using, just switching the type of model that we use, we got a 13% improvement in the performance of the model. And uh, another example for a marketing model, that it's a slightly different approach from the credit risk industry, but it's still, it proves that uh, the same concept can be applied to different areas we have seen uh, plus 15%. Of course, those numbers, they are going to vary according to the portfolio, the type of application, but we have seen consistently such kind of improvements uh, uh, appearing. And then, of course, one may think that, well, those are might be specific points around, uh, 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 around uh, client data only or some, some specific field, but it, uh, uh, when it comes to the bureau data, for example. So if you remove to the next page, please. And uh, particular for me, here is where the, the results are, are extremely outstanding. Because uh, when we think about uh, the credit scoring or its application or the application of machine learning, uh, when it comes to bureau data, we could see something I mean, in my perspective, it was, uh, it was incredible. Because uh, by applying such kind of methodologies, we could have 12% 12, uh, 12 more performance or more accurate scoring on young or riskier segments. And that it's important because, again, it goes in line to what we have seen previously. So you contribute to financial inclusion because there were some people before that they were not necessarily or they were not being identified properly, so to speak, or the risk it was not uh, uh, measured in the best way possible. So you could use machine learning to, to improve that. And then if you look to the overall perspective, you can still have a uh, very good improvement as well. So the benefits of, uh, of, of AI uh, overall, uh, not, not just on the, on the healthcare security, but also in credit risk, they, they are they are here. And uh, we, we need to, to, to find uh, intelligent ways of, uh, of exploiting it, because the benefits for the society, they are going to be uh, huge. 
But then again, we can, may come back to the other topic that it's okay, I have to explain the model. Yeah, that's true. So if you we move to the next page, please. Uh, there is uh, the explainability, and there is this EBA definition that I like very much because for me it's uh, it's very clear that it's about the, I mean, what it's explainability. So essentially, it's that the output of a model should be understandable by a human. So you you shouldn't have any doubts or why that is specifically outcome it's being it's being given by by the model, right? And uh, it. You, you may able to give or to have explanations out of it. So why you should have explainability? So you need to justify a particular event that was uh, predicted by the model. You need to control why that it's happening or uh, well, the, the reason that it's happening. But there is another very important point. You can use the explainability to improve or to discover. What is that about? So we, in the industry, we very often have an the classification of what we call the, the gray area. So there are uh, some particular individuals that they are on the on the middle of the score range. So you're not necessarily be able to really accept, but well, you're not so confident to reject as well. So you could use this kind of approach to improve and to discover more about those particular reasons. And then you work out for the good. So it's the utilization of AI for good. So if we move to the next page, please. So eventually you're going to have a consumer that if you are trying to predict what is the chance or the probability of a delinquent, for example, you can have that particular point. So on a probability range from zero to one, you get exactly the, 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 the middle of the way, 0 0.5. Now you need to understand, well, eventually that, uh, that number is being given, and here is just uh, a, a very simplistic example. So the, the amount due, it's contributing with 0 point, uh, 0.9. But then the age or, or, or the, the debt income ratio, well, it's bring that score lower. So, wow, but I still am in the middle. What, what, what should I do? If you remove next, please. This is where the black box actually comes to light. And then we, we, we come to, to understand. So eventually, as I mentioned in the past, we would think that, yeah, it's just the thing on the left hand side. So I get something in, I will have a number, and then I don't clearly understand. But that's not true because you could enlighten uh, and you could bring light to the black box and have something else. And then if you move next, we can nowadays reach a level of explainability where every single attribute that you have on the model can be measured to the exactly contribution for the final probability that you are predicting. And that it's awesome because it was one of the pieces that were missing that, well, we can think for the future to exploit it more, to bring more confidence to the utilization of AI. So maybe, apologies, but the letters, they might be a little bit um, uh, small for, for, for the screen, but uh, you would have, for example, on the red attributes, pushing the risk higher. But then you have the blue attributes bringing it lower. So you can understand exactly what it's happening in there. And then you can even work this, this thing out to remove any kind of uh, bias and bring also fairness to the model. Because you can understand, OK, well, this is particular something that it's not looking good. It doesn't, it doesn't correlate to any principle that we have to follow. And then you are able to change the model. Because this is another uh, important point. All of this that, uh, that, I, that I have uh, shared today, it's oversight by a human. So there is no, no automation because we really need to understand. And for me, the best data science is the data modelers or the, or, or the people that uh, are also working on this kind of model development, they must understand the business. And as much or as more you understand the business, the better your models are going to become because you can also have this kind of view. So I think more to be done, there is much more to be exploited and uh, well, the benefits, uh, they, they are going to be really, really huge for, for the whole society. That was it, thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you, Leandro. Bring uh, to the table also all these technical aspects in a table where I share the background with my uh, co-panelists here because we have here with us Jordanka Ivanova uh, here from the DG Connect and from the legal team who writes the the proposal on artificial intelligence that we are going to the to discuss. She is a legal and policy officer. And next to uh, Jordanka, we have all also David Brinkman, who is the senior legal counsel from the European Central Bank, and we'll discuss with him also the aspect and the, uh, the view from the European Central Bank, starting from the opinion that they, give, that they gave on uh, the proposal uh, at the end of last year. And finally, at least but not least, of course, we will have also the consumer view, thanks to uh, Augustine Reina, which is, who is uh, director from the Legal and Economic Affairs from uh, Buke. Thank you to be here and to have accepted our invitation now. Uh, Leandro told about, of course, all these technical aspects, in particular explainability and so on, which are an aspect related, of course, to the trustworthiness that uh, Axel was mentioned in his intervention at the beginning. But, of course, we know there are some odd topics in the proposal uh, uh, issued by European Commission, and I would ad outline three main aspects. I think that they are the more discussed one just now. That is to say, first of all, the definition of artificial intelligence. We have seen in one of the pictures from Leandro that he mentioned traditional logistic and linear regression, I mean, yeah. And if we consider, for example, the Article 3 and the Annex 1 and the techniques and all this stuff, of course, they are considered as not traditional, but artificial intelligence, which is one of the main aspects that we are discussing, of course, at, but we are not the only one. Of course, I will start with this hot potato <laughs> regarding the definition of artificial intelligence, and then to move to the other aspect very relevant for us, which is the risk-based approach that we know from other pieces of legislation, like, for example, uh, anti-money laundering and so on, applied to technology. And then to conclude with the impact on uh, Artificial Intelligence Act and the application to high-risk system as in the credit scoring. Let's start, I will say, uh, with the consumer view, with Augustine, please. What do you think about the definition and which are the consumer's view on Super. the hot potato <laughs> regarding the definition. Thanks. The, the whole pro proposal is a, quite a hot <laughs> potato. Huh? Um, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the, for the invitation. I apologize for arriving uh, um, a bit late, but I had the opportunity before, thanks to organizers, to, to watch the presentation of um, uh, the rapporteur. Um, before going into the discussion, specific discussion on the um, uh, definition, um, I would like to very briefly react to your, to your presentation, which um, I think you, you gave a, a very interesting example about how AI, you know, could develop, you know, in, in a way that can uh, provide some um, meaningful uh, solutions. And clearly, the transparency, explainability is an extremely important aspect. Something that wants to be also highlighted by the um, by the Commission's uh, own, own proposal. Um, and you say something at the beginning that um, AI, you know, used to be a, a, a black box, but especially um, from the um, the business side, you know, they're starting to be more take up, you know, based on um, on all these uh, different aspects that you explained. But we cannot forget that when we talk about, you know, consumers, it's not a black box. It's, it's like a like a black hole, you know, where all this data is being sucked. You don't know what's going to happen with that data. We don't know whether you are going to see it ever again, and what is the result of that. And uh, I just just want to bring to to your attention a, a survey that we did um, in Bell with our members at a uh, national level, and actually the, the the level of trust is, is quite low. Huh? Um, so, for example, um, we survey um, consumers across the, the union. And just to give you some, some data, you know, in Belgium, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, most respondents, 64%, so more than 6 out of 10, agree that companies are using AI to manipulate consumer choices. Whether this is, you know, happening on the ground or not, there's a different discussion, but the perception no, it's actually quite negative. Uh, trust in voice virtual assistant, for example, varies from 40% of suites expressing low trust in them to up to 71% in Belgium. 
And what I found really interesting is that more than half of the, of the people that have been surveyed doubt that authorities will be able to exercise control over AI. Again, whether this is happening on, on the ground or it's likely to happen or not, but this is the perception that people have. But when you depend on deploying these technologies on people using it and engaging it with this, you know, these are concerns that we cannot disregard you know, so, um, so easily and that needs to be uh, carefully taken, uh, taken into account. Now, going into the, um, zooming into the AI uh, proposal, as a, as, a, as, a general, as a general remark, of course, it's very much welcome that the Commission is regulating, is introducing a proposal for, um, for regulation in this, um, in, in this field. But what it's kind of surprises, us, you know, is that the, the word consumer or user, you know, is pretty much absent <laughs> in the sense that if these uh, AI systems are going to concern people, you know, and the fact that these people are not representing or the interest not um, clearly voicing the, in the, in the legislation as such, well, that, that poses some questions, which are, um, of course, important when, it, when things go wrong. You know, specifically looking at what are the, the, the rights that people should have in case of uh, our shortcomings so on and so forth, but maybe we can, we can talk about that later. On the definition, we you know, very much support the definition of the Commission. We think that was you know, broad enough, and we cannot forget that the definition of the Commission you know, needs to be read in conjunction with the annex, uh, with different annexes, huh? annex, um, uh, annex uh, 1 and, and, and annex 3. So first we need to see if the a certain technology will fall under the very broad scope, and then you go through different steps. You know whether there is a specific technique that is included in Annex One being used, and whether that is qualified as a high-risk AI system or not. So the entry point indeed is a definition, which needs to be a very broad definition. If we already start to shrinking it um, or making it too complicated, which from our perspective is what the the, um, uh, the proposal of, of the rapporteur um, might lead us eventually. Um, I think that will will jeopardize the the future proofness of the of the proposal as, uh, as such. Nice to hear. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned a few times uh, also, of course, the, how broad uh, is considered now uh, the, the definition as, for example, uh, we move starting uh, in our uh, latest discussion with the Commission and so on. But we know, of course, that it is a huge debate also with Axel Voss and the other uh, rapporteurs and co-rapporteurs in the European Commission, in the European Parliament, sorry, where, of course, there is the leading, one of the leading committee is related to consumer protection, protection and so on. That is to say Brando Benefei, but we have also uh, Drago Stutorace and so on. I think that uh, now another um, uh, question it related to this, of course, uh, for, uh, for your Danka is related, of course, to the definition of artificial intelligence and also to the reaction that uh, you received from stakeholders like us or like consumers and so on, related also to the idea of this risk-based approach, which is the first time applied to a technology or legal uh, and technology low tech, let's could say, that we know from other uh, sectors, like I said, anti-money laundering and so on, but it is a first attempt. And also it's a first attempt to regulate artificial intelligence uses. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I will say, please, uh, your comments or remarks on this and also consideration regarding to Leandro's presentation, if you have it. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me also in this very interesting panel in a very important moment, because as you see now, we have so many different views uh, also, um, and we are entering in a very intense phase uh, of the negotiations with the, the European Parliament, also with the Council, where very different um, opinions are expressed uh, on the Commission proposal, um, and we see that sometimes they can go into the two extremes. Um, uh, in, in our initial proposal, we have really tried to achieve um, many of the 
objectives actually mentioned uh, of uh, uh, MEP Axel Voss um, to build the trust uh, in the market and to enable companies to really benefit from these technologies um, and develop them uh, for the public good and for the consumer protection as well because uh, as very well shown in, in the presentation we see that they can improve accuracy they can improve also quality accessibility of certain services uh, and we think that artificial intelligence indeed is very important for European companies uh, for the society for consumers and we we really have to to create the right environment um, to allow everyone to benefit and in our opinion this also includes the right regulatory environment because uh, we have seen that indeed uh, you can have very good outcomes uh, and achieve those benefits that were mentioned. But on the other hand, because of certain challenges of this technology, you could also produce harms or bad outcomes. If, for example, the systems are not accurate, if there are biases already built in the system, or if, um, as explained, uh, they are not sufficiently explainable. So maybe even if banks are using them, they could not justify their choices. They could not give explanations that might be needed uh, also to consumers uh, or make their algorithm sufficiently auditable also for supervisors. Um, um, so our objective is indeed uh, to build also that trust uh, in both the business side when they also get uh, a product from the market because we know that actually banks might be developing their models themselves, but they can be also procuring or getting those models from technology providers. And, and many of the challenges are already there in that design and development phase. Um, um, so that's really our objective, uh, to create uh, legal certainty, to build trust. Um, what actually developers and companies have to do, like a rule book, uh, to, to, to embrace that technology uh, and, and use it for beneficial outcomes, and also to build the necessary trust in the consumers and also in the society. Um, because we think, indeed, it's very important to set the good story for AI. We don't want all of us to hear bad news where we see that already certain applications have led to biases, discrimination, and bad outcomes. And we have really seen that there is a, a, a huge risk of such pushback uh, from the society, which might even lead to, to request for certain types of applications to be completely prohibited. And we absolutely don't want to, uh, to go into that direction. So we really think that um, uh, an appropriate balanced regulation with very clear rules, standards, and procedures for companies and a system of certification can help everyone to benefit from this technology and bring all the good benefits uh, it promises to, to, to bring. Um, now, on the, as, as already mentioned, um, for the AI definition, I think um, our objective has been very much indeed to be future-proof uh, and also to address types of risks um, uh, and specific challenges that are characterized by, by those um, AI technologies. Um, and we have been very much relying already on, on what is the scientific consensus and also uh, in increasing consensus at international level with OECD, what Kind of, uh, kind of systems could be covered. So for example, this kind of symbolic reasoning, uh, logistic regressions, uh, we have seen actually that indeed the international consensus is that they can be also opaque, they can be also biased. So the objective was also to be as broad as possible and address the same challenges, but then indeed be more proportionate and narrow the focus because we don't think AI is dangerous as such. We think that it very much depends on the context of, of which uh, the application is used and the potential harmful consequences. So indeed, then our second layer of uh, a proportionality test is that we follow the risk-based approach and we really try to focus on specific use cases where we think that because of um, the biases or potential malfunctioning or, or inaccuracies, there could be very serious consequences for consumers, um, um, 
if those systems are not properly built. Um, and here, that's why we have tried to be very proportionate. And we think that the credit worthiness assessment and credit scoring for consumer protection, for consumer applications specifically, is potentially such a case because it could really determine the life um, and, and the access to finance or even lead to financial exclusion if, as mentioned before, those systems are not uh, properly built. In our assess in impact assessment that accompanies the proposal, we have indeed done a thorough assessment of, uh, uh, of the potential harms uh, and also of the ex potential relevance of existing legislation because AI is indeed not existing in a legal vacuum. And our assessment is that even for the financial sector and for credit institutions that are very well regulated, uh, those kind of specific challenges, uh, how those systems are built ex ante for fairness, explainability, whether they are properly tested in advance before they are really started to be used. Uh, we don't have such existing specific rules and uh, specifically for fundamental rights and consumer protection risks. And, and here we respectfully disagree with uh, MEP Vols that that could lead to, to full overlap with the existing financial legislation because there uh, either we have uh, the prudential uh, superv supervision legislation where we think more about uh, prudential risks for financial stability and there we have um, Michael, will, uh, David will talk uh, more about this, but certainly we don't see an overlap with, with, with the risks covered there. Uh, but we've really tried to make consistency and make the system as smooth as possible for regulated banks. Um, and also we have, um, let's not forget, many other players that are completely not regulated. And we think we should also have this uh, level playing field and have the same standard because our objective is uh, then to, to really create and help companies develop those systems in a fundamental rights manner with uh, fairness, explainability, the right of auditability, make those standards available to everyone so they can also benefit uh, from those available solutions and they can uh, rely on the certification scheme we propose to, to really claim the trustworthy benefits of their systems. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, your view. Of course, we have some uh, thoughts about, for example, the impact assessment for our sector and so on, and also basically related to the use of linear or logistic regression, which has been using for decades in our sector. And in particular, in this regard, in the difference between the provider of IE system, which are our industry here, and the financial institution and so on. But uh, now I leave the floor to, to David, in particular on this aspect, which is the sectorial aspect. Uh, in particular, uh, ECB gave its opinion at the end of last year on Artificial Intelligence Act regarding also the use of some techniques and the uh, need for a neutral approach in terms of uh, type of technology and so on. So please, what's the view of ECB, David, on Artificial Intelligence Act, in particular for our sector? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, I'll, I'll make two remarks in advance. Um, I, uh, first of all, the uh, opinions that I express here are my own. And the ECB has already published its opinion. I can highly recommend people read it. You can Google it, ECB opinion, Artificial Intelligence Regulation. You'll find it. Um, but of course, my opinion and what I have is strongly aligned with what we've said there, um, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, second remark is um, I want to praise Leandro for his tribute to the Terminator. I think if you discuss artificial intelligence, definitely move uh, mention the Terminator. I love that movie. Um, but now more seriously, um, about uh, the definition, um, well, we recognize that uh, the definition should not be too narrow uh, because you know, we want to ensure that future developments in AI are covered. Um, so in that sense, we can, we can follow it. Um, but in the opinion, we also explained that some techniques should not be, um, should, should not be covered uh, in our opinion um, by the definition. 
uh, like straightforward systems that do not um, exclusively determine access to finance that can maybe be considered to be exempt or treated more leniently. And the key issue here is proportionality. The definition of AI used in the AI regulation is broad and may capture several relatively straightforward, frequently used tools contributing to its customer's credit score. An example that's been mentioned many times already is the simple scorecard used in logistic regression. And due to the use of these tools for credit scoring, the AI regulation would consider them high risk and imposing them strict requirements. And yes, we support harmonized rules and also the cautious approach to trustworthy AI, but we also acknowledge the efforts by the legislature, and we also acknowledge the efforts by the legislature to provide, uh, as suggest here, a future-proof definition, uh, but proportionality remains an important point. A more proportionate approach could be to consider AI models used for credit scoring as high risk only when they entail greater potential complexity and explainability issues than a simple regression. And uh, this means to exclude from the high risk category the non-complex use of trusted, proven, and long-standing statistical techniques, which on its own you can wonder if they are an artificial uh, intelligence model at all. Um, and the standalone use of the techniques uh, I mentioned does not introduce new or increased risk. They have been around for decades and their interpretations are known and trusted. So many of the AI or machine learning models, because of the non-linearities and complex interactions among variables or features, are not um, straightforward to interpret. Artificial intelligence and machine learning models can learn, they can evolve autonomously, and this can present challenges in understanding and assessing the conceptual soundness of an artificial intelligence or machine learning approach beyond assessing its performance. It can also make it more difficult to identify the most important variables influencing the outcome. Those are, um, um, it, those are the models for which the AI, AI regulations high risk category could be of most value for users, supervisors, and citizens by imposing stricter rules. Um, so, just also to mention on how they are currently re regulated, um, on a standalone basis, I think everyone already knows they are, they are not regulated. It also depends, of course, on the context, whether it's, um, you know, if we, and, and I'm, I'm looking at it from my perspective, if it's within a bank, because we supervise banks, uh, or whether the banks have outsourced these to uh, third-party providers, which many of them are here, then we supervise them via the, um, the outsourcing rules that we have. Um, and of course, we look at um, uh, IT systems, and AI would be just a, would just be a part of it. Um, but on its own, we think that uh, the that the because of the absence of complexity, um, the traditional techniques do not warrant specific uh, regulation. Um, we look in a, in a larger, larger context, um, so um, subject to governance uh, governance rules, and and also increasingly data quality requirements apply. Yeah, so thank you for this first round of uh, answer and questions. I invite the public also, if uh, you have some questions to rise and so on, because I have so many questions for you uh, for years, but we have uh, only, I think, like uh, 10 minutes. And for the second round, I will start again from the consumer's view and from uh, Augustine, uh, basically on the on a feedback from uh, the uh, your Danka and David uh, considerations and also on the consideration regarding more the risk approach and so on and uh, what do you think about this or if there are some proposals that you are making uh, during the process the legislative process thank you thank you and thank you for my co-panelists for the very interesting comments um, as, as, as you probably um, know Beuk has been um, quite skeptical about adopting a risk-based approach, generally speaking, to, to regulation, um, especially if there are not necessarily safeguards for situations that do not imply a non-risk activity or other than high, uh, other than, than, than high risk. Um, uh, having said that, of course, the, the Commission has decided to, to go through the path of um, a risk-based uh, approach to, um, to AI system. To, to work on that uh, on that basis, and there there are two elements that perhaps are worth mentioning. On one side, is um, effectively trying to identify 
um, which are the AI applications, you know, that will merit to be qualified as a high risk to be included in the um, in the annex in the annex three, which basically is a is a I wouldn't say it's a political decision, but it's a decision that we need to take as a society in which we in which we decide which are the high risk activities that we want to regulate specifically under these under, uh, under these rules um, in, re in relation to credit worthiness um, assessment. This is something that has been already included, something that we also ask um, to, to include, and I think that has been voiced by the, both the European Parliament and the, and the Council, is the inclusion, for example, of AI, which is used to assess if someone is eligible to obtain an insurance in the field of um, financial services. You know, there are also other suggestions in other, in other fields. Um, but trying to identify really what are those um, applications that we as a society consider that are high risk. But then is the whole question about what happened, you know, with the non-risk uh, and the non-high risk uh, AI and what will be the, the minimum safeguard. And there we are, we are, we are asking um, to have um, some uh, baseline uh, legislation in this, in this regard. And of course, we do not have to follow the same requirements as for high um, high risk, because there is a reason why they are regulated as, as, as high risk. Um, but certainly, it should be some, some, some minimum uh, requirements. So for example, the right to redress, you not know, the right to uh, post a complaint as, a, as an individual um, uh, before a, a competent authority, the right to be represented uh, as, um, in, in the context of representative action, for example, in a collective claim, if there is a, a mass harm on a, on a group of, uh, of consumers, and of course, the right to be compensated. So these are kind of minimum things that should be present irregardless of what type of AI, of, of AI you are engaging, whether it's high risk or not, because um, in, in, in many um, scenarios, consumers will not necessarily be aware of the, of the level of risk that the, the legislation has. Um, has uh, qualified this uh, specific uh, AI system to, to bear. Thank you. So, so thank you. Now we have also some questions from the audience. Sorry, I was a little bit analogic. Uh, yeah, I think that it will be a questions both for uh, your Duncan and for David, because it's related to the supervision and to responsibility of supervision. And the question is, who will be, or I will say, could be, according to you, responsible for the enforcing of the Artificial Intelligence Act regarding the credit scoring in the single member states? And how will they coordinate with the, the financial, of course, regulators and the data protection authorities, which is another hot potato, I think. Yeah, for your Duncan and David, I think it would be a good to have your view about this. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. That's a very important question because it shows again our objective to ensure consistency and complementarities of the existing rules and for regulated uh, banks. We have specifically proposed that uh, we should have the existing financial supervisory authorities um, that in each member state should be also responsible for the market surveillance, exposed supervision um, of how the AI Act uh, is uh, fulfilled uh, by um, by the banks. So here we really want to, to keep the same um, counterpart uh, for regulated banks uh, also because we agree that there are important synergies that we could uh, ensure with the existing governance and supervision system uh, already that uh, is existing at member state uh, level. And we have, of course, very carefully read uh, also the ECB opinion and we have had a very good discussion um, for the potential role of ECB because uh, you know that they are for very large uh, banks. Uh, uh, it is the main supervisory authority and here I'm sure David will say more but we have really tried to clarify that because this is a new task uh, and it's not already envisaged in the mandate of ECB according to the treaties and the existing legislation. Um, now there have been proposals in the council to specify that even for very large banks this will be again the national authorities, but um, in case there are uh, risks that they identify for the prudential supervision. So this is really for the financial stability because I want to emphasize again, the AI Act is covering the consumer and fundamental rights risks, which is not really in the mandate of ECB. Then um, if because of the available documentation, they will be able to share information also with, uh, with ECB. Um, so this is the latest proposal in the Council. Please, David, your view. 
Yeah, it's it's a complex question, and I'll answer it on the reading of the Commission's proposals as it is now, uh, because it, things may change. But it's yeah, it would follow uh, there are several uh, authorities that would be involved. Um, it would follow the distribution of competences uh, between the ECB and and national prudential supervisors, the, the, the national competent authorities, which uh, are also part of the entire uh, single uh, supervisory mechanism. So it would be the ECB for significant institutions or large banks. It will be then the national authorities for the uh, smaller uh, type of banks. There will be other type of supervisors because there are other elements that fall outside our mandate we are a potential supervisor so potential supervisor basically means we check if the bank is financially sound uh, we do not um, um, so much look at sort of the market conduct uh, issues or our um, fundamental rights of citizens uh, at least to um, it's nuanced um, so expect that market conduct authorities national market conduct authorities will also uh, and privacy authorities will also be involved um, so that sounds like bad news because one of the elements of the question was how are you going to resolve these and how are you going to cooperate? Um, the good news is that the ECB is used to discussing with other authorities. Uh, as you know, the, the, the supervision of banks is already distributed between uh, significant institutions and less significant institutions. Uh, so we have uh, some experience there. Um, so if there needs to be some uh, coordination, uh, we're confident that we will manage. Thank you. So it will be helpful for industry uh, to, to know who is our <laughs> supervisor and so on and all this stuff in order to not du duplicate our work and, uh, you know, someone uh, something for the data protection, something and so on. So we are hoping that also this aspect will be fixed. And if there are no more questions from the audience or no, from this technical side. We have no other questions. I would like to thank you. Yeah, great, sorry, I didn't see you. Please introduce yourself. Hello, Pekka Liukkunen from Enenta Group, so representing uh, credit bureaus from, from Sweden and Finland, essentially. Uh, for Le Leandro, uh, regarding the uh, explainability and in, in the, I suppose, three models in, in this case, uh, specific approach that you showed seems like it is going into the details of that specific uh, credit decision, right? So you essentially see if you have payment remarks, let's say, then that's bad thing, and, and it's giving a negative impact, impact on your credit score. Uh, uh, how would you answer in those situations if the customer then follows up with the question that, what about if I change this attribute from my data point? What is my score then? Because the underlying tree model in the background, uh, it can happen anything. You change one bit of loan, for example, and you will get completely different result from the uh, actual credit model. Yeah, sure. So actually this goes to the fundamental way of, uh, of developing the, the, the risk models I mean, regardless the technique that you use. So there are some uh, fundamental principles that you need to, to pay attention. So like, uh, I mean, to avoid that uh, specifically on the example of a decision tree would be capturing that uh, a certain range would have a risk and would have uh, a different risk. And then if you keep increasing, you get a different one yet. So these kind of models, even if they would go for, for machine learning, they, they would still follow a monoticity uh, constraints. So we wouldn't accept such kind of behavior on the model. So to, to really go to the point of a nonlinearity, for example, would, uh, would, uh, would confuse or would mix uh, the, 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 the rationale behind the model. That's why um, I mentioned that it's important that the person that is developing the model uh, needs to know the business that they are in and the rules they are playing, literally speaking, because then you can uh, interpret what is happening in the model. So you go there and then you fine tune and then you go there and you, you correct. So you avoid that such kind of points are going to be uh, an actual issue. So, and, uh, and here in particular that highlights the point of, uh, of using the explainability to, to understand and to improve because you are going to leverage 
I mean, uh, let, let put that way, you would leverage what you have the in, I mean, the best of the two words. So you could really exploit uh, a more powerful calculation to, to improve certain aspects, but it's still you keep a human uh, oversight of uh, what is happening, so you ensure you have the both of the two words. Luis Carmona, I'm a Vice President of Phoebus, the uh, business uh, information providers. And I'd like to make a question directly to, to you, since you are here, you've been so easy, uh, Yovanka, to be here. Um, it's just a question on, on what's going on with the Axis, well, no, the AI proposal, because it's, uh, for me, it's one of the biggest challenges. New technologies has one of, one of the biggest challenges in the last decades for our industry. And I wonder if we really do believe um, that we are going to embrace it, because we've been investing a lot in AI from our particular companies, and we've seen that, but, and it, this is a fact, that if we use it properly, we could find out, we could prevent thousands of cases of fraud and a cascade effect. Do you know what a cascade effect is in business, micro business especially, that is mostly impacted? When one company has a, is a fraudster and leaves a, a lot of debts behind, it affects other in their area of action, it affects other businesses and mostly they are micro businesses. We are in direct um, uh, conversa conversations with the Federation of, uh, P of SMEs, and we do believe that there is a, a future if we use AI properly. My direct question is, would you be uh, happy to list a, maybe four or five cases where we go, we could go deeper, we will, um, the new legislation will allow us to go deeper um, without consent of the director. I'm particularly talking about director's behavior. If we don't have the consent, we cannot go ahead and use the AI on them. I wonder if you have that in mind. If we have four or five cases where we could go to go deeper on the director's behavior for businesses, especially micro businesses. I wonder if there could be an option for you. Sorry, but could you clarify without directors' consent? Yeah, the directors, well, the board of directors, sometimes their behavior is, is crucial in terms of finding out who is a fraudster and who is not. And without their consent, we cannot go deeper at all. So I was just wondering if you could exclude from this proposal maybe four or five cases or maybe three cases where you'll say, okay, it seems like it's going to be a fraud, so we will just keep it, and you could use the AI techniques to go deeper. Yeah, okay. I think uh, it, it sh we should clarify that actually the AI Act does not propose to cl classify at all as high risk uh, those kind of uh, AI systems used for uh, fraudulent detection of fraudulent behavior. So. Basically, you are completely at, at, at not affected at present because there is only one use case which we propose now. If you compare it, it's it's really minimal impact on on all the various applications that the finance sector uses. Uh, uh, we could add more in the future, but at present it's only this one. And, and then, in any case, we don't think we would go in such level of granularity of uh, really regulating uh, the internal processes, uh, uh, but, but rather focus on exactly these uh, very common basic principles that are uh, now, I think, an agree there is an agreement that uh, at also EU and international level about uh, the, the explainability, fairness, uh, auditability, documentation, because it's still a horizontal legislation. It has to be applied in a variety of, uh, of different uh, use cases. So I don't know if I, I hope I replied to your question, but I think there is a more space maybe for the financial sector to, if needed, uh, if there is such a need to, to look deeper into that issue. Well, thank you. Thank you for your for your answer. It's pretty clear. But I think we should discuss a bit further because some of the basis of this proposal may deduce that um, it could be difficult to get to go more 
deeper to to try to investigate those those possible fraudsters. But um, yes, you're right. It uh, will be a, a subject for next uh, for future discussions. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you. Thank you, Luis, also for coming here uh, to this conference today. And I will thank you, uh, all our uh, panelists, for this such inspiring discussion and uh, also to understand all of us. We, are, we have understood that it is just a start of the discussion because the procedure is quite long, as Axel Voss uh, told us in the at the beginning. So thank you, and let's see in the next steps of this procedure and discussion on artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, and from my, from my side, thank you very much, Elvira, and to the speakers for, for your discussion. Um, Leandro, not only you made an AI model explainable, I think you made, together with the colleagues, the whole topic more understandable. Uh, so I thank you for that. Um, I would like to encourage you, as David said, to uh, read the ECB's legal opinion, which is someone was asking me, I think it was published at the end of last year, around December, if I recall correctly. So that is a little bit of homework from my side. Okay, we are now coming to the first um, break. Um, we will be uh, resuming at quarter to 12. So you have around 20 minutes to uh, push up your caffeine levels. So I'll see you in 20 minutes time.